When it comes to words, we must do what we say and we must say what we do. Good morning, my name is Rod Embry. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. I am very excited that you have decided to join us and hopefully you'll stay with us because in a moment, we're gonna be talking about this from scripture. We're actually gonna be speaking this way. The Bible says we must do what we say and say what we do. So keep that in mind as we focus on the teaching in this program. Now, Corey is here to help us with Bible archaeology and history. Corey? Today, we are going to be taking a look at a series of ancient letters that were found that shed light on uh, the Promised Land before and during the conquest of Canaan. All right, very good. Corey is going to be with us in just a moment. What did you study for the scripture today? Well, you know, in the last several days, we've been studying the book of Numbers and we're rapidly coming to the end, which would be Numbers chapter 36. I'm going to review a little bit of what Numbers represents. All right, very good. Numbers, of course, is uh, taking the uh, census of Israel beginning and end. It's a very interesting one. Get your Bible out, get your Bible guide out, and join us as we study the Bible now. Jerusalem, it's been known for many years, is a very, very ancient city. Its history is stretching back to the time of King David. But even more recently, archaeologists have found a tiny tablet that sheds light on history before the time period of David, revealing that Jerusalem was a hustling, bustling city way beyond this ancient king. Recently, a tiny piece of an ancient tablet was discovered in an excavation in Jerusalem. It preserves Akkadian writing that has been dated to around 1400 BC, making it by far the earliest writing to have been found in Jerusalem. Due to the small size of the broken clay document, it's impossible to piece together what it said. However, it is clear that it was of top scribal quality, and it has been noted how intriguingly similar it is to the famed Amarna letters. The Amarna letters refer to clay tablets that were a part of Pharaoh Akhenaten's records, dated to around 1400 BC. They were written by kings of surrounding cities and nations. A prominent figure in the Amarna letters is Abdi Haba king of pagan Jerusalem, who is credited with writing six or seven of the discovered letters, and is mentioned by name in at least one other. The letters from this king of Jerusalem have been specially noted by researchers to be of a particularly high scribal quality, and they also portray a picture of a thriving, industrious, well-established Jerusalem smack dab in the middle of the time period of the judges. Biblically, this works. We're told that the people couldn't oust the Jebusites from Jerusalem. And King David gained special renown in the Bible for his conquering of this city, which he then chooses as his capital. The problem has arisen, however, that there has been almost nothing found archaeologically of this Amarna period city. Without the Amarna letters from Egypt, the Bible would stand alone in its description of Jerusalem before David. That is, until now. If this small clay fragment is what it seems to be, then it too proclaims, albeit quietly, that Jerusalem was indeed once a capable administrative center with a happening scribe. You know, the Bible receives scrutiny like no other book. And I actually think that's quite fair. The Bible, it claims to give us a view of God that is correct and a view of the world that is correct. And so if something is claiming ultimate truth, then it should be rigorously tested. Now, it shouldn't be tested with a vengeful attitude in which 
it has to be wrong. No matter what, it has to be wrong. If I go in with that presupposition, then I'm going to take all the facts and all the evidence, and I'm going to twist it and apply it to my own worldview, to what I want the evidence to say. But when you actually test something, you put it in front of you, and you try as hard as you can to remove your biases, whether you really want it to be true or whether you can't stand it to be true. You try to push those aside so that you can look at the evidence appropriately. And that's also, uh, that's why it's also important to listen to people who have an opposing view of your own so that you get a more balanced view of what you're looking at. But over and over and over and over and over and over again, evidence for the Bible has stacked up that its history is true. Now, even if every single word of the Bible is, is, is historically accurate, that doesn't mean that its theology is right. But it definitely leads credence to the fact that it is a faithful witness. If it's faithful in history, what else is it faithful in? Now, wisdom arrives with words that we use daily. The laws of God deal with words and how we use them and how we hear them. Words are important to us because they basically teach us what we really think about things. They can be used to describe our conditions to try to sell someone on something or to communicate what we have to do in order to keep track. But words are important. A vow in English is a solemn promise. It's a commitment. It's a way we want to do something. Now in Hebrew, it's found 60 times in 57 verses, meaning it is an offering of words. Numbers 30, verses 1 through 9. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord, and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself, and her father holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand, and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows nor her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will release her, because her father overruled her. If indeed she takes a husband, while bound by her vows or by a rash utterance from her lips by which she bound herself, and her husband hears it and makes no response to her on the day that he hears, then her vows shall stand, and her agreements by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on the day that he hears it, he shall make void her vow which she took and what she uttered with her lips, by which she bound herself, and the Lord will release her. Also, any vow of a widow or a divorced woman by which she has bound herself shall stand against her. Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 9. Numbers is an amazing passage in the Bible. It's an amazing book in the Bible. And as we study it, we learn a great deal about the book and the laws of God. We're still in Numbers, which is, of course, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the fourth book of Moses, Numbers. And then we'll move on to Deuteronomy, which, of course, is the fifth book of Numbers. But, beloved, there is a great lesson here, indeed, about words. Now, before we get started, I just need to mention to you that words are important. Dealing with the creation in Genesis, who was lied to first? 
It was the woman. The words distorted her view of God. And she allowed that to happen by Satan lying to her. She takes his word. Now that's important, so let's skip forward to the book of Numbers and we see the review. Now the review is this, wisdom in words. We're reading Numbers chapter 28 to 30. If you're keeping up with us in your Bible guide, make sure you do. And then our focus today is on Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 9. This is an amazing passage. Now, as we look at this passage, I need to pique your interest in something. Remember what happened back at the creation. Words tricked woman. She was the first one who was believed the lie from Satan. That's important. Okay, you got that? Here we go. Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Now that's an interesting point. Here is the, uh, the point that we need to focus on. We are bound by our words according to the Bible. What we say is the very thing that we must do. And what we do is the very thing that we must say. Now, there's a lot of discussion today about free speech in our society. Free speech is this and that, and everybody's worshiping it and running around, and yes, free speech is great and free, but, but it's somehow we've allowed the free speech to make our words careless. And never before in the history of humanity, in email and in all of the things, Twitter and Facebook, and have we become so lax on our words. We say something and then we are not accountable to it because it has no meaning to us. But let me tell you something, that words have meaning to God. God has meaning with words. We need to focus as believers in Jesus Christ upon our words. Do what we say, say what we do, and hyperbole has become a way of expression that has become a language. And we must avoid the use of hyperbole until it's obvious. Now that's very important and I need to talk more about that in the future, which we will. But look at this now. We go to Numbers chapter 30, verses 3 and 5. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house in her youth, she's a, a little girl's daughter and her father hears it, and her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself and her father holds his peace. Then all of her vows shall stand and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on that day and he hears then none of her vows, none of her vows nor her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand and the Lord will release her because of her father overruling her. Here's the point. God binds the woman to her father. When she makes a vow, he is responsible for what she says. That is interesting today because 46%, roughly about half the families, are non-traditional families. They're not families with father and mother anymore. They're families with mother, 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 and father, or families with father and mother uh, somewhere running around, or families with mother and mother, or, or father and father, and it's all messed up. And so the truth is that we must understand the reality of the family. The family, the father, was the reality and the standard for the household. Now that is really important for you to realize that, and that's important, okay? So now we need to go to chapter 30, verses 6 through 8. Watch this. If indeed she takes a husband while bound by her vows or by a rash utterance from her lips, by which she bound herself and her husband hears it, and he makes no response to her on the day that he hears it. Then her vows shall stand, and her agreements by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on that day, and he hears it, he shall make void her vow which she took, 
and she uttered with her lips by what she bound herself, and the Lord will release her. What an amazing statement. Here, here's the point. God binds the woman to her husband when she makes a vow. He is responsible for her. Now look at this. It was her father who was responsible for her, and now it's her husband who's responsible for what she says. And there seems to be this understanding that the woman was the one who was loose with her words. Now, as we grow along, and I'm not making a statement on women one way or another, but I am making a statement on men. Men need to realize the importance of their words. Gentlemen, it is time for us to grow up. It's time for us to stop whining and sniveling about our ideas and about what God thinks and what we want. And it's time for us to get real and to listen carefully and speak a lot less. Men don't need to yap and yap and yap and speak, but we need to listen and we need to carefully consider and we need to pray. Men of God in homes and men of God before homes need to pray. And I want to tell you something, you need to understand that this is what God expects from man. And so this message is for the men in the audience, that God has placed upon you a strong utterance. And we should pay attention to it as we study the scripture. in the program, you and I took a look at an ancient fragment that was recently found in the city of Jerusalem that proves the Bible's presupposition that the city of Jerusalem was a thriving capital city before the time period of King David, because when King David took it over, it, it was a big deal for someone to take over Jerusalem. Thus, it had to have been a really important uh, and flourishing city, which this fragment told us that it was. Now, this fragment is part of a group called the Amarna Letters. So right now, you and I are going to be taking a look at some of the other Amarna Letters as well as uh, the importance of the Amarna letters as a whole, because what these end up doing is putting the conquest and the time period of the judges into context for us. Take a look. In 1885, a large library of clay cuneiform tablets were unearthed in what turned out to be the house of the correspondence of Pharaoh, located in Amarna, Egypt. This record office of correspondence still housed letters from various kings, chieftains, and rulers who were under, loyal to, or partners with Egypt. These letters were written during the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled from 1350 to 1334 BC. This is after the Hebrew exodus from Egypt, and it sets up for us the time period of the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the time of the judges recorded in the Bible. All of the so-called Amarna letters are written in the political language of the day, Akkadian. And the ones from the area of the promised land are of particular interest. They are all asking for Egypt's help against enemies and invaders. Egypt is losing its grip on its far territory, and the land is up for grabs. The Bible is So Cool is the title of a 46-page booklet by Robin High School about the amazing facts of God's Word. Is there external proof of some of the remarkable stories in the Bible? Is there evidence of those stories? And does the Bible report on stories that are historically sound? The Bible is So Cool tells you. This booklet is ready for you now. 
or a gift of $5 or more above your regular giving, write and ask for The Bible is So Cool by Robin High School. In the United States, write to us at Post Office Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. And in Canada, write to us at Post Office Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. Or you can order on our website at www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's biblediscoverytv.com. Ask for your copy of The Bible is So Cool. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we continue to go through the Bible in one year from Genesis to Revelation. We thank you that you have decided to be there and stay with us as we do that. Now listen, next time on the Quick Study Television program, we're going to talk about something interesting. Here is what we're going to be talking about. God is at war with sin. Did you know that sin is still true today? Yes, even though you don't like it, it's still true. And we should be too. Jesus Christ is the battle plan. What is that all about? We'll talk about that next time on Quick Study Television. It'll be a good one, so stay there. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you study today? Well, I'm just going to back up a little bit by saying that it is our hope and our prayer that you have joined us, maybe for the very first time, reading through the Bible in its entirety. And this is such a great time to be joining us still in February, still in, within the first few books of the Bible. Um, we will not just pick certain sections of the Bible to go through, but we will literally take you from Genesis through Revelation because the Bible in its entirety is very, very important. And having said that, there are some who find that the Old Testament is very hard to comprehend. Or there are others that don't feel that the Old Testament is relevant anymore. And you couldn't be farther from the truth. And yes, it is difficult in spots, but I want to encourage you to persevere. And if you've been viewing and watching since January and you've fallen behind in your reading, that's okay. Don't be discouraged. Pick it up where we are today and continue on. Now, I want to take a look at numbers and just talk a little bit about it because we're already finishing chapter 30 of numbers today and it's almost complete because by 36, chapter 36, we're finished numbers. Hmm. So let's take a look at this. Numbers shows us how God responded to the unbelief of the Israelites and there are consequences to our disobedience, but God's grace remains and his redemptive plan and desire for us will not ever be stopped. Now, the book of Numbers underscores that for us, the importance of the obedience in the life of a Christian. And Paul, he reminded us as well of the value of learning from the way God has worked in the past. Paul quotes Romans 15 verse 4, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. He also later, the, the writer of 1 Corinthians talks about that as well in um, chapter 10, giving us Old Testament examples. If they did that in the New Testament and Jesus quoted from the Old Testament a lot, then we need to do the same. So Yeah, we do. And, and I, I like what you said uh, as well, speaking about the Old Testament and the New. Uh, that brings me to a point. I received some mail the other day from some viewers, and they were saying that, you know, we, why do you spend so much time in the Old Testament? You know, we can't understand it. We just want to forget the Old Testament. Because, we, you know, there's 39 chapters in the Old Testament, and there's 27 in the New. And so, and I, I said, well, the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Mm -hmm. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Now, that's not mine. That's from years ago. A great scholar said that. But it's good to pick up, and it's good for you to understand this and to know this. So we are doing this not so that you can get some laws that to press on people, mm -hmm. not so that you can manipulate the Scripture so that you understand it and you realize it. And God speaks. 
He does. Through the Old Testament, he speaks well. He absolutely does. In fact, when I came to Christ, I was reading Psalms and Proverbs. I wasn't even reading the New Testament, and I came to Christ. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways to find Christ in the Old Testament. And so we want to encourage you to make sure that you join us, that mm -hmm. you stay with us. You get a copy of the Bible Guide that way. Now, what you want to do, if you want to do that, please go to the website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and that will take you, if you give there, that'll take you to the place where you can get the Bible Guide. And that's very important because the Bible Guide is the print companion of this program. You're going to want that Bible Guide. Also, you can write to us at P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150 in the United States or in Canada. You can write to us at P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Those are the addresses. Those are the numbers. That's everything you need to get a hold of us. So we'll be looking for your letter this week. When you write, include your prayer request. There is no question that God takes man at his word. God also takes woman at her word with the binding of man. Now this may seem unfair based on the situation, but keep in mind the real reason that woman was deceived by the word of mouth. Women have a better idea of who is lying and who is not because as a representation of humanity, she was lied to. Satan lied to woman, making her more susceptible to understand the lie. It is important to do what you say and to say what you do. To be consistent with your words is critical. We are and become what we say. This is critical to becoming a Christian. We must become committed to being as transparent as possible and we must say what we mean. Words are important, they are important indeed. And I want to tell you some words today. Jesus Christ is the name, and he is the one who came 2,000 years ago, and he died on the cross. And you say, well, why did he do that? Well, because the sin of humanity. He died upon the cross, and then he rose again on the third day. And when he rose again, he said, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus Christ made a way for us to get to heaven by accepting him. Come to Jesus. Thank <laughs> you.